Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Nisnik, and I'm the Sexual Assault Services Director at Turning Point. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about human trafficking, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So, I've been at Turning Point for about 10 years now in various positions. Um, I started there as an intern and worked my way up through the ranks. So, now let's talk a little bit about Turning Point, if you would go to the screen, please. So Turning Point originally began in 1978 as a domestic violence research project and then a shelter opened in Rupaul in 1980. Our current shelter was built in 1989. Uh, we currently have 25 beds available. We began receiving separate sexual assault services, service funding in 1995, so that's when my program was actually created. We have five service programs, including the sexual assault program, the Domestic Violence Program, the Child and Youth Services Program, the Legal Program, and then our Shelter Program. Then we have our Second Chances Thrift Store, where 100% of the proceeds from Second Chances go to keep Turning Point up and running. And then we also have a outreach location in New Richmond that I will talk more about in the next slide. So I think it's important to note that Turning Point serves all victims of domestic and sexual violence. That includes all gender identities, ethnicities, abilities, and sexual so you can see there's a couple of different pictures from our locations. In the upper left-hand corner, we have our group room. So currently, all of our support groups are taking place via Zoom. You can find more information on that on our website. Um, but this room does exist above our second chances group store on our third level. That's where we usually hold our groups. Below that, on the bottom left-hand corner, that is our second chances group store storefront. That's located on Main Street in River Falls. In the upper right hand corner, we have our St. Clair County Outreach Office. That's currently located next to the center in Richmond. And then below that, we have um, one of our rooms from our shelter location in River Falls. That's our children's playroom. So, turning point services, we really try to cater them to the individual that we're serving. But generally, our services include a 24-hour crisis line and text hotline. So this is um, manned by an advocate that is trained 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have our temporary emergency shelter that's located in River Falls. Uh, personal advocacy, so that is really a range of services that we provide from making copies for people to helping them meet their basic needs, like hygiene products, um, and then access in our food shop. We offer restraining order assistance, our online support groups that I spoke a little bit about. Um, we keep a list of information referrals of resources in your state for counties, which is our counties that we serve. We offer community education um, on domestic violence, sexual assault, um, body safety, things along those lines, and of course human trafficking, which brings me here with you all today. We offer legal and medical advocacy, uh, so that can consist of accompanying somebody to making a police report, to sitting in a courtroom for a criminal court case, family court case, um, and the medical advocacy is that we actually are part of the crisis response with St. Clair Valley Sarge, so we can respond to hospitals um, to get evidence kits collected um, and then follow up appointments and some of those lines. We offer emergency transportation. So we know that living in a rural area, transportation can be difficult at times. So uh, to try to supplement that, Turning Point does offer transportation to our shelter location as well as to other appointments that our clients may have. Last but not least, we have our Home Start program. So um, when somebody is transitioning into a new safe housing, um, we can come to our Second Chances store and we can help facilitate them receiving furniture and other household wares to um, help them to be set up in their new homes. Now to the topic at hand. Uh, so throughout this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the various parts of human trafficking. Um, but first, let's start with the definition of trafficking. So there's three parts that need to happen in order for a situation to meet the trafficking definition. So the first piece is the process is the action. 
So that's recruiting or harboring or moving or obtaining a person um, for a particular means. So that's by force or fraud or coercion, which is actually really common. And then the last part is for the purpose of involuntary servitude, debt bondage, slavery, or sexual exploitation, which is the one that I'm going to be most focusing on today as it falls within my program. So now that we know what trafficking is, let's talk a little bit about what trafficking is not. So there's some common misconceptions that go along with human trafficking. The first being that trafficking affects one group in particular. Um, really, anybody can be a victim of human trafficking. There are certain things that traffickers may seek out, certain vulnerabilities um, within people uh, that would make it easier for them to perpetrate a crime against. But really, um, it could be anybody or any socioeconomic group um, or anything along those lines. The next part is that trafficking victims are always foreigners. So when people think of human trafficking, um, sometimes they think of Asian massage parlors or of people from Eastern Europe. Um, but actually, people are being trafficked from America and America or in the United States uh, every day from rural areas to, to urban areas. Another common misconception is that trafficking and smuggling are the same. Um, smuggling is actually a crime against the border, so helping somebody cross a border into another country, that would be a crime against the border, whereas trafficking, you need to have those other elements present in the definition that we talked about. So, um, like co forcing somebody to come across the border for purposes of involuntary servitude, that would constitute trafficking. So another misconception is that people think that when somebody is entering into sex work or, or human trafficking, which we're really focusing on now, um, is that they know what they're getting into um, when they're being approached. Uh, but really, nobody can consent to um, what might happen in a transaction of somebody buying another person. They don't know that person. They don't know exactly what that's all going to entail. And they don't have a lot of control of what's going on. It's usually somebody telling them to do something, and then that buyer is controlling what is happening within that room. Um, so nobody can consent to that if they don't know everything that's going to go along with that. So one thing that comes up a lot when we're talking about human trafficking is what's the difference between trafficking and prostitution? So really, one cannot exist without the other, um, because trafficking is the marketing of prostitution. The main difference is that in trafficking, there is somebody that is trafficking another person. So whether it's a pimp or, um, or another thing for a trafficker in that situation, they're the ones that are usually calling the shots and are in control of what's, what's happening within that. With prostitution, um, there's usually adults that are involved, um, and there's not necessarily anybody um, over them controlling their money, what they do with their money, or when they have jobs or, or anything else those lines. Um, but really, there's been a debate among people of whether prostitution was ever an actual choice in the first place, um, just because a lot of people that do enter into prostitution or do sex work um, have prior traumatic experiences um, that would make them feel like prostitution or sex work is the best choice for them. Um, so there, there are some debates and, and, and things along that, along those lines. Okay. So control tactics. So there's a couple of different things that traffickers do uh, to maintain control over their victims. Um, so first with the recruitment process, more often than not, it's not somebody um, jumping out of a van and kidnapping another person. Um, it's usually done through a grooming process, whether that's online um, or meeting them at the mall, at school. You know, there's a lot of different places where um, this can occur. Uh, so after that person, if the rapport has, has been built um, and that person has entered into human trafficking, um, then there's a breaking down process before the victim is put out or put to work. And that 
process is called seasoning. So really the goal of the seasoning process is to completely break down the victim um, using a combination of physical, mental, and emotional means so that that trafficker can have absolute control over them. So some of these tactics are on our power control wheel. Uh, this is very similar to the power control wheel made by the Domestic Abuse Project in Duluth. Um, a lot of the dynamics are the same of an intimate burden around the relationship to human trafficking. It's all about power control. Um, so some of these are, I'll read them out loud, are intimidation, emotional abuse, isolation, minimizing, denying, and blaming, sexual abuse, using privilege, economic abuse, coercion, and threats, and then intimidation. Uh, so while the physical abuse and sexual assault are definitely parts of the seasoning process, um, if a trafficker can, can use intimidation or emotional abuse, you know, the minimizing and isolating their victim, those are the tactics that they're going to most likely use versus that physical force. Um, because we know it's easier to get somebody to do something if you make them feel like they want to versus forcing them. So that is, as well, a part of the seasoning process is, is to, um, is for that trafficker to develop that relationship with their victim and those dynamics that go along with it using these tools to maintain control. So now let's talk a little bit from the survivor's perspective of you know being a victim in trafficking. Uh, so there's significant levels of trauma. So throughout the seasoning process, there's traumatic things that are happening to that person. Um, as they're being sold, um, more trauma is occurring. And then a lot of times victims that are entering into human trafficking have prior um, abuse, whether it was growing up in abusive households or whether it was experiencing um, childhood sexual abuse. So it's, it can be really complex and there are a lot of different levels to this trauma. Uh, there's a lack of awareness of available resources, so that is by design and also happens throughout the survivor's experiences. So isolation, as I pointed out in the power and control wheel, is a tool that a trafficker will use to maintain control over their, over their victims. Um, if they keep them moving, um, then they're not going to get familiar with any surroundings, they're not going to um, build any type of support people or really know anybody to reach out to that it's harder to access resources. And then again, um, there's also a lot of distrust for service providers based on their own experiences, whether they grew up in a system or um, they've had their own um, contact with law enforcement or social services or even with advocacy as well. Um, depending on how those experience, experiences went, um, it could have built by a lack of trust to access those resources even if they have the ability to do so. And then the trafficker is going to reinforce that mindset as well because it makes them easier to control. Um, and that goes along with the uh, belief that no one cares to help them. Um, a lot of people look down on um, sex work or on human trafficking um, that, you know, it's not, it's not socially acceptable. You know, there's, there's a lot of other dynamics that go along with it, which is why people that purchase other people aren't necessarily talking about that. Um, or less like when the mom talks, you know, that they participate in those types of things. Um, so they're, they're kind of seen as, as a lesser than, um, so that nobody cares. So which again reinforces their other experiences that they may have had. Um, and then there's the normalization of exploitation. Um, so in, in my line of work, I've truly seen how resilient that people are. Um, and people are survivors and they do what they can do to survive every day. And that also goes for um, survivors of human trafficking. So they've developed ways um, to be resilient. Some the body just naturally does, like with dissociation. Um, and some people have just, you know, learned to do and they have picked up coping skills, um, you know, and that's where substance abuse and some of those other things come into play as well. Uh, 
So this trafficking has now become a part of their everyday life. Um, they've gotten into a routine. Um, they know what is kind of generally involved in that, and they've um, developed, you know, some sort of comfort in that routine, and um, have probably come up with some perceived control over the situation, even though it's the trafficker that's doing that. Um, but all of those things together really impact a survivor's way to self-identify that they're a victim. So if they think that they're willingly participating in that, even though the trafficker is the one that's in control of the money, if they're talking about all of these things, um, they still think that they still feel like they're making a choice. And so if I'm making a choice, then I'm not a victim, right? Then I have control in, in what's going on. So that's also So a little bit more about human trafficking, so how it's marketed essentially. Um, so technology transforms the game. That's what human trafficking is referred to um, by people in, in the life. You know, it's, it's the game, it's the life. Um, what is, what's really happened is that you can now order a person online like you order a pizza. Um, there's not necessarily any more traps. You know, we stereotypically think of um, like a woman um, standing on a on street corner waiting for somebody to approach them or then approaching cars. You know, that's what we think of when we think of human trafficking. Um, but that's not necessarily the case anymore in larger cities that, that might still be happening, but more often than, than not, um, they're being advertised and people are accessing them through, um, through websites. So Backpage, My Red Book, and Craigslist websites were um, some really big ones that traffickers were using to advertise their um, victims. There, in the last couple of years, there's been um, a big push for reform on those types of websites, so they have taken some steps. Um, but that's the thing about the internet and, and with technology, is things are always evolving, um, and traffickers are um, so social networks are, are being used for that. Um, adult websites are, are also being used to market and for people to purchase other people off of. Um, prepaid cell phones have made it harder for people to um, track or follow what's been going on. Um, but one positive to using the technology is that it does create some advantages for investigations and for law enforcement things um, to either recover survivors um, or to um, catch jobs or people that are purchasing other people for those services. Because uh, that's really how we're going to make an impact in human trafficking is by eliminating the market. Um, so traffickers are looking to make money and they're looking to profit. Um, and human beings are, you know, when somebody trafficks drugs, drugs can be sold and can be used one time. But if you have a person, you can use that person over and over again for the same purposes, just by meeting some basic needs. Um, and then there is, there's an endless supply of people. Um, so if we eliminate um, the market for that, if we make it harder for people to buy or if we, um, have stricter punishments or are you know, prosecuting the people that are purchasing other people, that's how we're going to start eliminating the market because if there's too much to lose by participating in that, people aren't going to do it. Okay, so how, are, how, can, we, how can we help um, survivors? So the, the first part is, is identifying who they are. So again, this is difficult because of what we what I've talked about before is that they're not going to necessarily identify it, and there's also going to be distrust for service providers. Um, but some things that stick out is that there's a lack of freedom for that person to, to leave their living or working conditions. You know, they can't um, just go and meet up with somebody somewhere. They're not free to come and go. Um, they have few or no personal possessions or financial records, so they're obviously they're not going to have their own bank account because they're not in control of their money, um, because they're moving around and they probably didn't have the opportunity to pack up all the things that they wanted. They're, they're not going to have a lot of personal possessions. Um, they are going to 
have a lack of knowledge of the community that they're in just because that's that's control tactic. Again, that we talked about is that traffickers are going to be moving their people around. Um, that's to drum up business by having fresh people, and that's also um, to keep people in the dark about where they're at. Um, so if they're under 18 and providing commercial sex, they can't. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, the age of consent is 18, so um, having sex under that age, I think mean, it's against the law, so they, they can't. Um, like I said, they're not in control of their own documents, so if they're asked for identification and the person that looks like might be their partner hands over their ID versus them handing over their ID themselves, you know, that's something to pay attention to, something to look at. Um, and then, of course, signs of physical abuse, restraint, and there's branding. Um, traffickers use tattoos as well as actual branding, um, malnourishment, and then there's a general lack of So trafficking, what this looks like a little in our area, so I can speak to um, turning points experiences. The map that I that we currently have on the screen, I took from the Polaris Project. So I want to give a shout out to them as well. That's where I get a lot of my information. Um, so if anybody is interested, you can see the website is up there um, to get more information. And, and the Polaris Project also runs the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, so if you, hopefully you can see, um, but so the dots, the, you know, the spots on the map, that's the calls that are coming into the hotline for whether they are people seeking services as being a trafficking victim, um, or people reporting and making tips of things that are happening in that area. Um, so you can see that there's a big spot over by us, we're in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, but like I said, um, the urban doesn't necessarily matter because in the upper, in the northern parts of Wisconsin as well, you can see that there are bigger spots of people calling and making tips or people seeking services as well. So it's really in um, any area, any gathering of people, you know, somebody um, can be trafficked. Uh, so how it's presented most likely or more than likely to turn point in my experience is that, like I said, people aren't, they're not identifying themselves, um, but we're identifying that they're victims based on the information or the lack of information that they're giving us. Um, but it's often presented as a domestic violence or an intimate partner violent relationship of that person who's maintaining um, control over their partner and having them be trafficked for rent money or for drugs or, you know, um, for a multitude of different reasons. Um, so then once they start, you know, listing off those things, then, then we can um, identify that they're going to the trafficking and it's not just a um, domestic violence relationship. So serving survivors of human trafficking, they, they are a very tiny population and that's because of the significant levels of trauma that they've experienced. So they really need a team of people around them to, to help them. Um, so there's that crisis intervention, um, there's emergency housing, you know, a lot of people aren't, they're not, if they're being trafficked, they're not gonna necessarily have a place, they're gonna be being moved around, they're gonna need clothing and food and other basic needs. Um, they're gonna need protection and safety planning, um, traffickers, aren't usually giving up their victims very easily um, because what they're doing is illegal um, and also that person is their commodity, like they're using them to make money so they, they don't really like the work with them. So there's going to be safety concerns. Um, so, uh, you know, who have to be survivors going to be the social services or any advocacy, case management, medical and health services, you know, that emotional support, um, employment assistance. So the average age of somebody to end up into human trafficking is 12 or 13 years old. So if they're being trafficked, most likely they're not going to be going to school. Um, they're not going to be learning these other skills, you know, that we're learning as, as participating um, in the community outside of trafficking. Um, so they're not going to 
necessarily know how to create a resume or what skills they have that, that would be marketable. Um, they're going to want daily accompaniment um, because again, they're not they're not being exposed to those other skills. It's going to be difficult, you know, to um, not only with the fear of like the trafficker following them or knowing where they are, but also you know making a grocery list of preparing food for the week. That's not necessarily something that they're going to like a skill that they're going to have. Um, so they so they might need some help with that. Um, there's interpretation or translation services. Um, that is something that TrainPoint helps to provide. Um, we also have a bilingual advocate as well. But that's not only for the survivors, that's also for the, um, for the service providers to be able to make sure that they're serving that person to the best of their ability. There's legal services. So that survivor might also have some charges against them that they need assistance with. Um, that occurred while they were being trafficking. Um, there's been some stories in the news. Um, I'm sure people have heard about Crystal in um, Kenosha. Um, and then counseling and mental health services. So again, with the significant levels of trauma that people are experiencing, um, they might need somebody to help process through that with them, or um, maybe they're going to need um, some other you know, medications or other assistance with, with what's happening. Um, the literacy education, so again, if people are being trafficked, they're, you know, when they're essentially in middle school, if that's when everything starts, they're, they're not going to be um, able to attend high school and receive that, that type of education. So um, they're probably going, if they're interested in that, they'll probably um, have to do to GED tests and, and get classes in that way. Um, and then, of course, transportation. So they're going to target the kid that's lagging behind a group of friends 
um, that doesn't necessarily have any anywhere that they belong to. Um, under, or they're going to be able to identify if they're not having that support at home, and then they're going to develop that relationship with that child. You know, whether it's through buying gifts or getting compliments, you know, to fulfill one of those basic needs that we all have as, as humans. You know, is to be um, is to belong and to and to feel love. And so those are two of the big things that traffickers use to um, recruit and start to build that rapport and then to um, alienate that person from the rest of their support system. Uh, so then the child or the, or the person actually leaves willingly with the trafficker because they feel like they're going to have a better life. You know, they're going to have all this money, they're going to have all these gas, their prom vacations, you know, all of these things. Um, so um, it's important to understand those things, you know, have programming services that people can participate in, you know, to, to build that sense of community. Um, and then, of course, to support local organizations. So places like Turning Point and things like that, that we um, offer assistance to victims and provide that education. So here's one of our last slides. This is the Human Trafficking Information Referral Hotline. So if you come across something that you suspect to be human trafficking, you can call this hotline and you can make a tip and the hotline will follow up with that tip or you can text be free. Um, and then the last slide is just, um, well these are my references and resources. So again, the Polaris Project is a, is a big place that you can go and check out to get more information. And then the actual last slide is my contact information. If anybody had any follow-up questions or anything else, they can feel free to reach out to me. Uh, so thank you all for your time today. Thank you, Crossbow Clinic, for inviting me to uh, share information on this topic. And I hope that everybody stays um, healthy and safe. Thank you.